All right, how's it going, y'all? So today we are going over a home lab video, and these are going to be five huge mistakes new people make whenever they're building out a home lab, and these are things you really want to get right the first time and do not want to have to do because they're really easy to fix on the front end, but really hard to deal with later on down the line. And so these are pretty basic, and I'm just gonna go ahead and get right into it. First off, look at the power draw and the noise of everything you're buying on eBay. I'll show you a video, the B-roll is gonna be gorgeous right here, of my server rack. I, I have a 24U server rack with numerous servers going in there from eBay. I am absolutely a hypocrite with that, but I do run a business out of here, so it is justified at least somewhat. But everything I do, I make sure that it's low power draw, relatively low power draw, and quiet. That is the biggest thing. So right here, the server rack is just beyond that wall, and there is an open door in between where I'm filming right now and the server rack. It is 10 feet away, and it's complete open door. You can't hear it. You can hear the refrigerator, and I cannot hear the server rack. That's because everything I buy, I make sure, and I do a lot of in-depth research to make sure that it is quiet. And quiet is going to be relative to every single person. For me, the level that it is there would not be acceptable in my living room. But since it's not in the same room as like my living room, it is okay. It's in my guest bedroom. I just basically turn some stuff off whenever guests are in town to make it a little bit quieter and not so much heat. I'm also able to leave the door open, which helps a ton with cooling. Because if I close that door, the room gets pretty toasty, which is not great for electronics. So that is number one. Really think about, hey, can I spend a little bit more money but get a far superior piece of equipment that actually allows me to. In all reality, the majority of home labs could be run off of a couple Raspberry Pis or a Synology NAS. Even the less powerful stuff, you do not need that much horsepower to do the majority of home lab things. Computers are pretty powerful. And pretty much everything you're doing in a home lab for most people, unless you're doing a hardcore video transcoding, can be done in a small box like this, an Intel Nook, or in a lot of cases, a Raspberry Pi. So really look and see, start off small and try that. And number two is something you see fairly often in tutorials, and that is when you're setting up your network, do not use the subnet 192.168.1.1. I have seen a tutorial. I'm not joking when I say this. The tutorial said, don't use 192.168.1.1. Hackers know you use that. And anybody who knows anything about networking knows that they're going to know exactly what subnet you're on if they're able to exploit it. It is absolutely silly to think that that is actually protecting you from hackers, to think that, oh, changing your subnet is going to make you at all more secure. No, that's not the reason why you do it. The reason why you want to change your subnet is you want to change your subnet to something that one, is easily identifiable as you, and two, something that you're unlikely to see when you're going to a coffee shop. Because eventually, when you're running a home lab, you're gonna wanna be able to go back to your services securely. And so you'll probably set up a VPN server. And that VPN server may get confused if you're on a coffee shop that's 192.168.1, and you're connecting to your house and your Synology or something at 192.168.1.10. It's gonna say, hey, I can't see 192.168.1.10 locally, I don't know where it is when it does not know to go down the VPN tunnel because you're on the same subnet. So when you're starting off is a really easy time to do it, is change it. So mine is 10.30.0.0 slash 16. That means I've got a ton of IP addresses so I can organize everything exactly how I'd like to. And I actually have, and I'd recommend you do the exact same thing. I have an Excel spreadsheet where I document every single IP address because it is so nice to be able to have that and reference it later on. Number three. Do not virtualize your firewall. You will see a bunch of tutorials online and I get a lot of people asking me questions. Hey, how can I set up PFSense to run on a Synology NAS? Technically, you can do it. You can probably figure out how to get the networking to work. Do not do it, seriously. Virtualizing firewalls leads to a huge annoyance where one, you're doing kind of a clunky setup anyway. And then if the Synology goes down or whatever you're hosting on, now all of a sudden your spouse, your family, whoever, no longer have internet access. There are three things I pretty much never virtualize for clients. One is PFSense or any other router. Don't do it. Spend $100 on a used computer or something and run it on its own piece. 
Seriously, you want to run your firewall on physical hardware, not on a virtual machine. Then two is going to be a file server. File server, specifically something like TrueNAS, you can actually virtualize them, but you're losing a lot of efficiency and you're gonna run into weird things where it's trying to grab the disks. If you wanna do that, I would really recommend running TrueNAS as your operating system and then use the virtual machine manager on there. TrueNAS scale has a very good one to actually run all your VMs because that's going to be by far the most efficient way to do it. And three are users PCs. Virtualizing users PCs and having thin clients is something you can do in massive organizations if you do everything perfectly, but if you do anything wrong, it's going to suck for them. It's really worth it to pay for people's desktops unless you just need them to remote in and like, a lot of people will have a QuickBooks license for a single computer and everybody just remotes into that, that's fine. But people's day-to-day -day computers, you don't want a network outage to take out everybody's productivity and everything like that. So it's much better to have everybody have their own computers. Those are the three things I really never virtualize. But one, the router is never do it. I promise you it is worth the $100 to do it. Otherwise, just keep your current router. Now, if you want to have your own home lab network behind your main network, that's fine. You can deal with the downtime. But don't have the one that runs your family's internet connection be virtualized on a machine. It is going to lead to some very annoyed family members, spouses, whatever. It will take out your internet. All right, so now with that, very similar is going to be DNS. So for DNS is phenomenal, but you wanna make sure you do it right. So if you're going to do DNS and you're running something like PFSense or now also Unify, both of those have the ability to have custom DNS records for local IP addresses. Otherwise, you can set up your own bind DNS server. The advantage to doing it on your router is that if your router goes down, okay, your internet's already down, so who cares? Like, it doesn't matter if DNS doesn't work really anymore because your router's already down, everything's already kind of broken. Versus if you do it on your own dedicated thing, like a Raspberry Pi, if that Raspberry Pi goes down, effectively now it's also taking out the internet. So I would really recommend setting up your own DNS server. It's great, you never have to remember an IP address again. You can manually hit up everything, you can connect to all these services, all just remembering the host name. But make sure if you're going to do it and you're not doing it on your router, to make sure you have at least two DNS servers running replicated. So I, for a very long time, had one running on my Synology NAS, and then I would also have it replicated automatically to a Raspberry Pi. And so that way, if the Raspberry Pi or the Synology were down, the other one would take over and still fulfill those DNS requests. So definitely make sure to have that because it's going to be something that will take out your entire internet access effectively if your DNS servers go down and you set up DNS. And five is set up backups and monitoring for the important stuff. You're gonna to throw together a lot of stuff that's nice to have, but really not that important. Definitely, definitely, definitely make sure you have monitoring Zabbix is a great place. It's a little complex to get started, but it's totally free and it's fun to set up. And it allows you to just monitor all of your stuff and see if anything's gone wrong. So for me, I can go to Zabbix and boom, I can see every single thing for me and my clients of automatically created issues and so many things. I can tell, oh, hey, this is getting full. This drive I need to expand, whatever. That's all monitoring here for all my virtual machines, all my services, even the SpaceRex website also runs off of Zabbix, and Zabbix is monitoring all of it. Absolutely phenomenal. And the other piece is back it up. You do not have to back up everything. You do not need to go and spend hundreds of dollars a month backing up terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of data, stuff you grabbed offline, whatever. You don't need to back everything up. But make sure you have a well-tested backup for everything that's crucial. Family photos, tax documents, anything like that. Make sure if you can't live without it, it is backed up and back it up in a single location with a standardized method. I would not recommend just doing the copy to a hard drive thing because that quickly gets very confusing and you don't have a good solution. Really look at a script or something that automatically backs everything up and check it every couple of months and just make sure you've got that. You don't have to back everything up because if you think you have to back everything up, you're not going to back anything up. Instead, make sure to think about the things you actually really need backed up and make sure they get backed up and check on them. And then the last piece that kind of goes in with that is any decisions you're making, make sure that the internet stays up, especially if you've got a family and multiple people in the house, make sure that no matter what tinkering you're doing with a home lab, the network stays up. 
my rule is everything that runs the Wi-Fi to keep Wi-Fi up is in my network closet over there. And then it's connected to all my servers in my home lab over there. So that way, no matter what tinkering I do in my rack, no matter what, I am not going to have my wife drop off of a meeting because I accidentally took out the internet. That is something that's really important to me. And I would really recommend doing that from the start. Think about the path to get from your internet to the Wi-Fi. That's the path I always think about and make sure that stays up. And that way your spouse, your family, whoever will be much happier with the home lab and be happy with the services it provides rather than thinking of it as annoying annoyance that every couple of weeks takes out the internet when you, they need it the most. All right, well, that's going to be it for this. Go ahead and leave any other tutorials you'd like to be, see me check out in the comments below or any other home lab content you'd like to see me make. All right, have a good one. Bye.